these four forces will, uh, over the long term, create an environment um, that could potentially lead to, again, he asked me to talk longer term, to higher levels of income inequality, uh, which could be a challenge. So there will need to be uh, leadership uh, underway to ensure with technological advancements, with healthcare advancements, with the demographic shift and the instability of climate change, that we're able to uh, balance these forces in a way that allows for stable economic growth. Uh, and there's some risks to that if those dynamics aren't, aren't, aren't thought. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Alan Dunn, to host a series of in-depth conversations on the topic of what it takes to be a world-class allocator. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolios. And with ever-increasing uncertainty around the globe, being well diversified across many different strategies and themes in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized allocators and the processes they follow to harness the best returns for their clients so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that, Please welcome Alan Dunn. Thanks very much, Niels, for that introduction. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Casey Clark. Casey is President and Chief Investment Officer at Rockefeller Asset Management. He is also a member of Rockefeller Capital Management's uh, Management Committee. Prior to joining Rockefeller in 2019, uh, Casey was Managing Director and Director of Sustainable and Impact Investing at Glen Mead, where he helped launch and build Glen Mead's sustainable and impact investing business. Uh, Casey, good to have you on. How are you doing? Likewise, doing well, thank you. Looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us today. And as ever, before we get into the meat of the conversation, we like to get a bit of a sense on our guests' background, where they started off in markets and how they got involved in markets in, in the first place. So maybe if you could just give us a brief intro to your own uh, background. Yeah, yes, happy to. So I'll break my experience down into maybe four phases. You know, one was as a bond trader and portfolio manager. Two is a macroeconomic research analyst. Three, I launched and managed an ESG investing business within a business. And then four, currently as deputy CIO, and then my current role as CIO and overseeing Rockefeller Asset Management. So I'll just give a few comments on each of those phases. You know, as a bond trader and portfolio manager, you're learning that interest rates, credit, and really the the forces driving the economic machine, which which are vast, right? And that led to a real interest for me in understanding the economic machine, which took me to a passion of macroeconomic research analysts. And in that role, think about uh, setting strategic and tactical asset allocations. And in there, the appreciation of complexities and forces driving economies and markets just continued to grow. But you, you get a better understanding of the influences behind rates, spreads, equity multiples, commodities, and geopolitics. Now, what well, maybe we'll circle back to later, but what I underestimated at the time about that experience is I also sat on a manager selection committee. And through that, I heard hundreds of portfolio managers pitch from equities to alternatives and fixed income. And and what struck me is they they all or many of them sound the same. And it just reinforced 
know, how hard it is to outperform. You need a differentiated edge. You need unconventional thinking and you need a consistent, repeatable process. So, so that was an important lesson that, that maybe we'll try to circle back to later. Then I'll go to just the, the third part of launching and managing an ESG investing practice. So here, the focus was on assessing the risk and return ramifications of ESG information. And now much of the data in this industry is overanalyzed. It's, it's hard to find undiscovered data or data that's not fully formed. So I was enthralled with the idea of, of uh, the environmental and social implications and how that drove prices in multiples over decades. And I would speak to people uh, like George Serafim, Harvard professor, leading ESG academics. He's one of the first to write uh, the implications of materiality and momentum, which is focusing on improvement uh, and creating alpha enhancing signals. And it just led me down uh, an enormous rabbit hole of how you can use that information in the pursuit of performance. And then as you know, deputy CIO and in my current role, you know, two areas I focus on just for you uh, and the audience, you know, one is just process, process, process. How do we continually advance and improve the investment process in pursuit of excellence? Excellence is something that if you worked here, you would hear a lot about uh, from our CEO on down. And the other is, you know, hiring portfolio managers and growing into new assets. So we focus on you know, differentiated strategies within a niche or asset class where we believe we can capitalize on a market efficiency. So right now, my job isn't necessarily to be the world's premier portfolio manager. It's to identify and hire 10 world-class portfolio managers and analysts uh, in, 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 in grow the overall business. Okay, good stuff. So maybe just um, to, to delve into that a little bit more, obviously Rockefeller Asset Management I believe have about 13 billion in assets under management. So maybe just give us a sense on the types of strategies you mentioned, a focus on niche um, uh, and kind of differentiated strategies. But how would that kind of 13 billion be split across the different uh, asset classes? Yeah, so I'll uh, maybe helpful just to start from the top. I'll just it, how we fit in a Rockefeller Capital Management too. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. You know, so we were the original family office for John D. Rock. Fast forward to today in Rockefeller Capital Management, we have three divisions, right? One, global family office, two, strategic advisory, and three, asset management. So with global family office, think sophisticated, multi-generational wealth strategies built on a world-class technology platform, right? Think high-touch client service, unique investment opportunities, open architecture, and access to the, to the unique ecosystem of intellectual capital available at Rockefeller. With the second division, strategic advisory, think uh, investment banking and strategic advice uh, for corporate clients, but also for business owners, and many of which could be family office clients. Uh, and then asset management. Right? You mentioned around $13 billion of assets. We manage money for individuals and institutions across equities, alternatives, and fixed income. So I let me um, uh, I just go into those briefly. So equities, alts, fixed. And think of our, our equities. I'm just going to use round numbers in each instance. Think around eight billion of assets across multiple strategies, high conviction, long term focus, with an emphasis on high quality companies. Uh, we're, we're the fortunate beneficiaries of the Rockefeller family, who were early uh, in many aspects. Uh, as an example, we were 34 year U.S. small cap investing track. I mean, that, that's phenomenal, 34 year. We have an over 30 year global equity investing track record. And for many folks in the US, uh, global investing still to this day uh, is, is, is not as widespread as when you're investing outside of the US. So the Rockefellers were very early there. And it was not only global investing, but ESG investing 30 years ago. And we have an over 10 year uh, track record of thematic or mega trend investing. So in those strategies, from global to small cap, the thematic, think 40 to 60 stock uh, portfolios that are high conviction. Uh, and alternatives, think around, you know, close to a billion, 900 million of assets, a long, short equity strategy that seeks to deliver on correlated alpha and a fintech uh, uh, strategy focused on venture capital uh, within the private market. Fixed income, we have a burgeoning, you know, taxable, tax exempt, preferred, and tax management business, and and will likely be growing uh, into to high yield here soon. So, does that give you a good idea of Rockefeller Capital Management and Rockefeller Asset Management? Sure, absolutely. And um, 
You mentioned, I suppose, that history being the the original uh, Rockefeller family office. Uh, I mean, would it be fair to say if you were to uh, take all of that, what you've kind of touched on there in in terms of some of the points around the focus on ESG and interest in thematics, would you say is there a, an overriding investment philosophy that uh, encapsulates all of that? It would just is it kind of equity focused, value focused, thematic focused, or, or how would you describe the the, the kind of investment philosophy of the firm if, if there was one. Yeah. So w- when, when I think of investment philosophy, you know, there's a lot of different styles of investors, right? You could have a great growth investor, a great value investor, a great macro investor, a great high quality investors. So when, when, uh, when we're thinking about the investment philosophy, it's finding that niche, uh, narrowing in on that in honing and differentiating that skill. Now, now, many of our long-only strategies are high quality in nature. Uh, we believe over the long term, that's what's going to generate out performance. How do you define that? Think high return on capital, low net debt to EBITDA, solid operating margin, strong free cash flow. And, and we talk a lot about the six key characteristics of an outperforming firm. So one, strong management teams, right? Two, clear competitive advantages. Three, end market growth. You know, four, balance sheet strength five ESG improvement and six valuation. Now that's easy to say and communicate. It's harder to identify those stocks. Because not many people are going to argue uh, with me if you say, hey, what's an outperforming stock? And you say, well, if you can find a stock in a growing end market or a company in a growing end market with a clear competitive advantage. So who's capturing more market share in a growing market with a strong management team who can allocate capital and manage their balance sheet with ESG improvement uh, and a decent valuation that that's a nice company. It's just about identifying those is where we focus a lot of our time. Okay, and in terms of the kind of clients you serve, obviously thirteen billion, sizable, but still probably regarded as kind of boutique relative to the the the, the, the mega cap um, black rocks of the world, etc. So from that business perspective, um, which uh, t- types of clients are you kind of focused on on serving? Would you say? Vague, but ranges from institutions to individuals. So on the institutional side, you have a large, well-known consultants uh, through to uh, large intermediaries or strategic accounts, as we call them, uh, and then down to ultra high net worth individuals. Okay. So so maybe just thinking about, you know, the the kinds of strategies uh, that you're running and, and what you're trying to achieve with those portfolios. You know, what would you say when you're kind of thinking of launching a new offering? How do you think about how, what's, what, what to add into the mix? And, you know, what, I guess, what are you trying to achieve with those portfolios? The focus is on differentiated strategies, niche asset classes or themes where we can capitalize on a market inefficiency. Um, we, we, we talk a lot about, we joke that we don't want to compete with the trillion dollar managers. I, I once was in a meeting with one of the CEOs of those firms who would uh, talk about how select strategies don't move the needle for them anymore. You know, small cap doesn't move the needle. These firms are becoming so large that some of these uh, either niche themes or differentiated strategies or asset classes uh, will increasingly, I think, become overlooked. There's inefficiencies there, and that's the opportunity to generate out. So first and foremost, we think about uh, an asset class where where you can deliver that, where we have an ability to capitalize on that market inefficiency through there. So you're going to think about things like uh, private equity, private credit, small cap, long short, uh, and both with high yield, both corporate high yield and municipal high yield. Now, we don't offer all of those today, but those are the areas that uh, one would consider. And within there, again, niche and differentiated thought process, unconventional thinkers. Uh, where where we believe that we can hand over heart have a competitive edge. Okay, I mean, obviously, we're we're starting to see the uh, asset management industry evolve in terms of you know on a number of axes. I think it's fair to say. Just curious to get your thoughts on a couple of those, maybe before we go more into specifics of some of the strategies. But you know, things like AI, you know. Uh, greater use of um, active ETFs. You mentioned privates. I, I guess this this kind of the, uh, ongoing um, growth of the private versus public markets. I mean, which of those would you say are, are, are the kind of the key mega trends that you're kind of 
try to position the firm to capitalize on, on, a, on a kind of a multi-year basis? When we think about strategies that could become mature at scale, think about three things. One is the strategy, two, end market, and three, vehicle. And we need alignment there. So with strategy, people process performance. With the end market, uh, distributing that into a growing end market with three, the right vehicle, whether that's an ETF, mutual fund, interroll fund, things of that nature. If all three of those align, uh, you can get strategies at scale. But, you know, first and foremost come the people, the process, and the performance. So th- 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 those are the three areas that we think about that hits a little on privates with end market growth. I know it's, it's been a tough time this year uh, with private equity firms raising some down rounds and large institutions lowering their allocations to private markets. But there's a secular trend for uh, an increase in alternative weightings uh, for many investors that aren't considered institutional, there will continue for many, many years. So that's an example where if you can find the right uh, people process and performance, uh, you have long-term end market growth in private market investing, uh, and then you have that in the right vehicle. Now, as you know, uh, there's not a lot of daily liquid private market vehicles, so ETFs don't necessarily apply there. Just to touch on uh, ETFs, since you mentioned that, yeah, there, there's a noticeable trend uh, from mutual funds to ETFs, uh, Rockefeller Asset Management, along with others, are just going to continue to uh, deliver vehicles that are in demand, which include ETFs uh, more and more. Uh, what do you think is, sorry, just on the ETF one, I mean, it's something that we do see, uh, you know, in my own background, more in the managed futures trend following space, even in that space, we're increasingly seeing firms go into the ETF space. It, I mean, from your perspective, is it just convenience or is it the intraday dealing capability or, or what, what do you think is is driving that secular trend as you say of, of etf growth convenience intraday trading tax efficiency okay so you talked about you know in terms of thinking about what makes a, a su- successful um scalable product three three things obviously from from in terms of people, process, and performance. So probably a good segue into, you, you mentioned, I, I guess a key part of your role nowadays is appraising uh, investment managers, appraising portfolio managers, and trying to determine which ones can truly deliver alpha over time. So, I mean, obviously, performance is is a, is a natural thing people look at, but what else? What are the key drivers when when you're appraising any strategy or investment managers that you think about to, to try and determine consistency of performance? Yeah, look, and as I mentioned, my role here too, it's it's hiring and building out, you know, world class portfolio management and analyst team. It's also ensuring that we maintain, um, adhere to and run a disciplined process that requires full time focus. Uh you you mentioned, you know, performance that tends to be something that everyone thinks about. What's, but what's underappreciated is process and style. So consistent, repeatable process. Underperformance can happen over near-term cycles. It's it's okay if it's a result of your process. For example, if you have a high-quality process and, and high-quality stocks are underperforming, you, know, you can manage through some underperformance as long as the long-term trend is higher. So th- there's a big focus on uh, a process there. I, 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 I do want to add, Though, if you want me to get more specific, so for we, we have a benefit here at, at Rockefeller of just having a well known brand. So, when you're speaking about hiring people, it's world class talent, it's sourcing that world class talent, and then it's assessing them. And we have a seven point criteria to do that. Um, and when I make a world class talent, I, I've been pretty amazed. You know, we, we posted an analyst role, uh, in fact, it was in 2022, um, and we got 1,450 resumes for that role pretty quickly. Our, our intern program at Rockefeller Capital Management, 22 slots. We have 22 slots. Uh, and these are for interns coming in this coming summer. We have 8,600 resumes. So that's a 0.2 to 0.25% acceptance rate. And, and for analysts, especially coming in, we look at seven things. Right? One is analytical capabilities. Two is investment judgment. Three, idea generation potential. 
four, culture, five, work ethic, six, passion, and seven, content expertise. And, and I would just add, look, there's a lot of very intelligent, collegial, passionate individuals, but does that flow through into investment judgment in alpha? That, that, that's the objective is can we flow that through to investment judgment and help? And I mean, I guess nobody would disagree with any of that. It probably the million dollar one of those is probably investment judgment more than anything else. I mean, for people coming in early stage in their career, obviously you don't have a track record to assess people on. Is there qualitative pointers to, 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 to people that, that would suggest that they would have an ability to be, to have good investment judgment, do you think? For people early in their career, let's just simplify it and say maybe undergrads or MBAs coming out of a school, it's passion and intellectual curiosity. It's passion and intellectual curiosity. Those are the two main things. You need to be excited about this role. It's challenging. And it's a lot of hard work and you need to wake up every day excited to take that on. So I, I mostly try to convince people not to join the industry. <laughs> and, and, and what you want is people who understand that, uh, but are just so passionate about it and have such intellectual curiosity and ability to connect dots. And you have to think they're an unconvi- unconventional thinker. And, and you just want to see this kind of relentless pursuit of excellence in investing. And with with uh, folks in that level of experience that's mostly what you can look for okay and but uh, say for pe- people who are even more experienced um you know obviously you can look at, you know uh, look at all these factors i mean you can have the tailwind of a bull market say so if you were a you know a, a, had, a, had a bias towards kind of mega stock investing or large cap investing uh, in the US for, for a decade, you, you, you would have looked pretty good for, for, for most of that period. So how do you allow for, for the kind of the particular environment that a strategy has been, been run in? Look, you, one of the things I talk about with uh, one of my colleagues, outperforming is very challenging. And especially in an area like large cap, the majority of people don't outperform. Every resume you get says the individual outperform. And, and that, that, that doesn't mean they're lying or misleading. It's just, you know, what's the benchmark and maybe my ideas weren't included in the portfolio and had they would have been, uh, had, you know, were they included, uh, we'd see strong outperformance. So that is uh, one of the most challenging things. The only thing you can do is put them through a rigorous interview process. We have three stages. Uh, you can remove, you can try to attribute their performance by removing uh, the contribution from factors, right? So, you know, large cap tech growth investors will clearly look better in certain environments than others. So it's just about uh, having the right benchmark. But but it also goes back to uh, when you're building a team, uh, the right skill set and the right personalities. And, and okay. we talk a lot about the goal is not to be right, it's to get to the right answer. So you, you want to see in an interview uh, in fact, one thing that I look for is for someone to say, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, that, that's, that's important. We need people to say that because analysts uh, have three jobs. You know, one is collaborating in the team, and let's just put that to the side. Two is selecting stocks, and three is advocating to get those stocks in a portfolio, or stocks or bonds. And all too common in our industry, um, you can have someone in that third area who maybe has some unfounded confidence and can convince people to put a stock in a portfolio. And you, you, you need to guard against that. Um, conversely, you could have people who are excellent stock pickers, but have a hard time communicating and advocating for ideas. Uh, so these are things that you just need to uh, identify, constantly adapt, uh, learn from, and try to get to those answers through an interview process, which includes stock pitches and which includes um, some intensive debates. Does that, that answer the question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the second part, obviously, is process, people process. I mean, you look at any slide deck from any asset manager, any fund, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk about the, 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 the rigorous investment process. I mean, from your perspective, what differentiates a good process from a, a, an inferior process? Consistency. And that means 
if you're speaking to a portfolio manager and then individually speaking to an analyst, you should hear a pretty consistent message. No style drift. And a lot of people know what to say. They're convincing marketers, but but it's do they believe it? Like, and, and does that flow through into, if you say you're a high quality investor, you know, look through a portfolio. Does every company have on balance, there, there's no perfect companies out there, like there's no perfect people, but is on balance, the portfolio, high returns on invested capital. On balance, is it low net debt to EBITDA, right? W- what are those quality metrics and do you see that flow through? And so it's trying to identify uh, those issues. And, and at Rockefeller, you know, we think about, you know, one is our, our idea generation, Two is our research effort. And three, we have a stock pitch. And then four, uh, once a stock is owned, we have uh, for select strategies, shareholder engagement efforts. And we're increasingly trying to increase idea generation from our quantitative work, from our shareholder engagement team, from our Rockefeller network. So, I mean, that's an interesting you know, point. I mean, obviously, you, you kind of mentioned the dual part of your role in terms of this domain of you know, partly hiring uh, PMs, but also, I guess, putting the right environment in place, I guess, uh, to enhance the investment process. I mean, you touched on some of those things in terms of idea generation in, in, in different areas. I mean, have you looked at anything, uh, you know, a little bit outside the box or, or do you look at, say, academic studies for, for ideas or do you um, you know, I, 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 you you mentioned kind of the the, the quant work. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that more in a bit more detail? Yeah, ha- happy to. These are areas that we're trying to grow out for differentiated sources of ideas within our quantitative work. For example, uh, we spent the last year building a pretty unique uh, long short thought model. That, that right now is just a model running in the background with no assets in it. Um, that was a 12 to, to 16 month exercise that has shed light on how do we quantify those six key characteristics. So for example, how do you quantify management quality? Uh, and you can do that through capital deployment. And in fact, Empirical Research Partners uh, is, is excellent at this. So capital, what, what are management teams? What should they do? Well, they should deploy capital. How do you deploy capital through the use of leverage, through the use of buybacks, through the use of paying dividends, through M&A? And those things can be quantified, right? High quality stocks can be quantified. Uh, Earnings quality can be quantified. So it's just a matter of, uh, from a quantitative perspective, finding unique alpha sources uh, that Quantify, help quantify your process and then challenging analysts and portfolio managers say, well, why wouldn't you pitch this stock or why wouldn't you pitch that stock? Uh, other areas that we're trying to, to uh, uh, generate greater connectivity is so shareholder engagement team. And in select strategies after we own a stock, we have a phenomenal shareholder engagement team uh, that works with companies in order to help create shareholder value. Uh, they, they are closer to companies than many analysts in the industry. Uh, the insights that they glean from those conversations should lead to greater ideas. And then lastly, we have the Rockefeller Network. It's harder to uh, quantify, but while there's no, just as an example, formal connectivity between Rockefeller University, between Rockefeller Foundation, uh, there is informal connectivity there. And there's informal connectivity to academic networks. So, for example, if you're researching future of food companies, uh, and uh, I spoke, you know, maybe I'll give a shout out to Dr. Roy Steiner, who uh, oversees the food initiative at the Rockefeller Foundation, who grants significant money away to future food companies. Understand uh, what he's seeing and what he's looking at and what maybe he's nowhere near hitting the public markets for what could be disrupting this industry. Uh, I'm an advisor to NYU Center for Sustainable Business. They have a pretty innovative engineering and kind of future of solar lab. So what kind of technologies are in the lab that could reach mainstream that could disrupt the solar industry? And these are things that, you know, the the Rockefeller network can provide. It it, it opens doors that are often closed by others. And when you call or email someone and say, hey, we're from, you know, I work at Rockefeller Capital Management. 
you, you tend to get a call back or an email back more often than others. So it's trying to use and, and get more intentional using uh, specific you know, tools like that for differentiated idea generation. Makes sense. I know um, obviously a big focus of your own in your career and obviously as well at Rockefeller has been ESG and sustainable investing and I suppose linked to the whole area of thematic investing. So maybe a good to touch on that for a little bit. Obviously ESG as a you know, as a as as an element of the process in the first place, and and also good to get your perspective on, you know, where ESG will go, you know, in the next few years. I think it's fair to say maybe it's been a little bit maligned in the last while, uh, with with some skeptics in the market, even though it's kind of maybe well intentioned. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say ESG is here to stay, but. I mean, how do you see ESG involving as as a style or or as an invel- an element of the investment process for 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 most asset managers? So we 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 talk and write a lot about that. We think we've been writing about this for years that the world will differentiate between ESG leaders and ESG improvers. Right? Leaders is best in class and worst in class, and improvers is focusing on your trajectory. For you, improving or declining. And to us, that's just part of good investing. Are you improving margins? Are you improving profitability? Uh, is management quality improving? Is your ESG footprint improving? And, and that's where our work suggests you can generate uncorrelated alpha. You know, the objective with ESG information is to generate alpha. Um, so that, I, I guess that's point one that I would bring up. Point two, as far as uh, where is the industry going, 85% of assets are in Europe. They get the vast majority of flow, the vast majority of assets. Um, it's probably no surprise that that's where uh, we spend a lot of our time, and that's where a lot of the clients are asking us questions about um, how we use EST information in pursuit of alpha and how we use shareholder engagement to both create shareholder value and change. Now, what, just one of the common I want to touch on as it relates to the U.S., because I think ESG is just so incredibly misunderstood. Everyone just associates it with divesting or they think Tesla's ESG or not ESG. It, it, to us, ESG investing is not the panacea. It, you can't make a bad investor good through ESG investing. We, we just want to try to make a good investor and good investment process better. I mean, we're trying to inch out additional alpha in what is a very tough industry. And that's how we approached it. In fact, I, I'm, I'm writing, just finishing our annual letter which goes in our uh, sustainable report in, in the last two years in 2021 and 2022, even before this sediment arose in the U S uh, I wrote that one of the top five trends was the drawback of divesting will receive increased media attention. And, and that's worth re- reinforcing because divestment may generate unintended consequences that could lead to worse outcomes for uh, societies and investors. And, and I mentioned George Serafin before he has a lot of great research and one of which was a 2021 paper called Hyperboles and Realities. And, and he wrote that, which I agree with, that markets have a correction mechanism for when a company's valuation falls significantly below its cash flow generating capacity. And at some point, a buyer steps in and often from the private markets. And that hurts transparency, that limits investors' ability to, to, to affect change. And it also results in near-term deviations of performance compared to, you know, traditional benchmarks. Um, so I think in the U.S. it's it's just widely misunderstood. Uh, most people are using this information to try to eke out additional sources of excess returns. And in, in, and as I mentioned, you know, there just is a growing divergence between the U.S. and Europe. I mean, through if I could remember the stats, through Q3 of last year, you saw 68 billion of inflows, 68 billion of inflows into European sustainable funds. In the US through Q3, you saw eight and a half billion of outflows. And you, know, you, you touched on that kind of differentiation between leaders and improvers. And I mean, is that, a, and as you say, the kind of the focus has shifted away from you know, ESG uh, maybe initially being thought of as, as the exclude e- exclusions, you know, don't invest in tobacco stocks, et cetera, uh, or maybe don't invest in, in energy. 
Uh, and increasingly, the conversation seems to be about, well, who's going to be part of the solution and who, who are, 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 are the improvers? Do you just see that as a, as a lens to, by which to find opportunities? Or is, that, is it also a constraint in terms of portfolios that, you know, that, they, that they're able to be classified as uh, you know, um, a level eight uh, ESG fund in Europe, et cetera? Because I, I think a lot of people view that, that you know, the, the accusation of greenwashing tends to come from that perspective that, that, that funds are just being you know, constructed so, so that they can be jammed into a particular category. Uh, as opposed to being constructed with with kind of the the most optimal portfolio in mind, we're using ESG information with the goal of trying to enhance alpha. I mentioned this notion of improvers, and it, they, where did this come about years ago? You have your kind of quote unquote ESG leaders, which increasingly captured a valuation premium. So if you can find companies that maybe are average or below average from what the average person or the media thinks is an ESG company, but yet you think they're going to improve, um, you could generate alpha in excess or alpha in positive change if you identify those companies, see that improvement, help them improve. And in fact, when they become a leader, sell them when that valuation premium happens. Um, so our, our objective from this standpoint is how do we use this information to generate alpha performance? I think focusing on those improvers, again, just part of good investing um, and, and then focusing on some potential mega trends that, that we could get into or not gives us the highest probability of doing that. This is not about divesting from energy companies. Uh, th this is about understanding environmental and social implications uh, and trying to use that as an edge to generate performance. Okay. Well, you touched a little bit on on kind of mega trends there, and we've we've kind of talked, you know, mega trends maybe a little bit from the perspective of the, of the asset management industry, but maybe, you know, thinking more broadly about what the investing world might look like over the next number of years. Um, you know, for a decade we had a period of low inflation, moderate economic growth, but it was very favorable for for equities for beta. And as we've come into this decade, things have changed a little bit. Obviously, 2022 was a tough year for traditional assets, uh, stocks and bonds, both struggling. But 2023 is step back and a good year for equities. I mean, do you see uh, any big picture changes in the landscape this decade? Do you think 2022 was an outlier or do you think we're into a different type of investing environment that we were in uh, going back uh, four or five years? I could touch on... Um the dynamics this year, but longer term, I see four kind of mega trends that are going to continue to shape economies and markets. And that's one, tech, two, healthcare, uh, three, demographics, and four, climate change. From a technology perspective that probably requires uh, no explanation uh, from your audience. Uh, healthcare, I think there's going to be dramatic advancements relative to decades past in uh, healthcare technology. Demographics, it's more than just uh, populations getting older and how that impacts the economic machine and also changing consumer buying preferences for younger generations. And then you have climate change. Uh, climate change, I believe, will transform economies and markets. We are just at the tip of the iceberg of seeing some of the ramifications of that. So it goes back to what I was saying before about returns, just understanding uh, the potential implications of these things and using that information uh, in order to try to develop you know, unconventional and differentiated insights. And I, I could also just go into, you know, this year, because more near term, I, I do think broadly speaking, we are just in decades, decades, unprecedented quantitative easing. And we are going through a long and slow period of unwinding. That, that, that will not happen overnight. There will be more sideways markets. Uh, there will be more volatility. I envision that you'll have, uh, and again, with, with such a rise of growth investing that you could have 
a, a resurgence of value investing where things like free cash flow matters. Now, it's not going to go back to, you know, the Benjamin Graham days of value investing, given how much the world has changed and, and the technological advancements. But there will continue to be, uh, in my view, a, a focus on free cash flow generation and this high quality bias. W- what was interesting is if you read a Reuters article in 2022, December of 2022, it would have said that 60 plus percent of economists were predicting a recession. And then it, and then it said 75% of economists said that their GDP forecast was skewed to the downside. Now, you come into this year and that's already below 50%. So last year was too negative. This year, it seems like the market is just too convinced on a soft landing. You have S&P 500 earnings that are expected to grow at about 11%. S&P 500 earnings expected to grow to 11%, yet the Fed is supposed to cut rates six times. And it's just hard to square those scenarios. An economic environment that is supportive of above average earnings growth and an economic environment needing six rate cuts. So the the truth uh, in the near term is probably somewhere in the middle, right? More robust or more modest earnings growth coupled with fewer rate cuts. And even if you, you reduce earnings growth next year to 7%, you're still at around a 20 times multiple. I mean, it, it feels a little rich, but it is in an environment where you have, you know, 4% treasury years. So, so the market could muddle through much of 2024, could consolidate last year's gains. I think some of the laggards uh, from 2023 could perform better. But, but I also think this is just emblematic of a world where we are trying to slowly wean off of quantitative easing. And I mean, take, taking those mega trends that you touched on um, in terms of technology, healthcare, demographics, and climate change, hard to disagree with any of those. Um, and obviously, there will be a winners and losers within those. And obviously, I guess your equity focused portfolios are going to be looking at uh, you know th- those opportunities. But p- putting them together from a macro perspective, does that point to? Stronger economic growth, do you think? Does a strong point to the potential for a higher inflationary environment? Does it point to an environment of higher yields, do you think, over time? Or, you know, can you draw any kind of macro uh, inferences from from those mega trends? Well, well, yeah. First, uh, you you brought up a good point. It's easy to say those things are mega trends. It's easy to talk about mega trends. Uh, It's harder to identify companies within those mega trends. Um, that are priced attractively, that have the high quality characteristics that we talked about. So that that is, it, it's very easy to talk about these things. It is a little harder to uh, execute on those, and that's just that's just worth reinforcing. That that's a big question. Um, the greatest challenge for policymakers, and I believe I'm paraphrasing Ray Dalio, but this just stuck with me, is to engineer. You know, and you're talking long term. Now you wanted me to talk long term. So I am a capitalist system that raises productivity and living standards for consumers, right? Without worsening inequities and instability. And so when you think about that's the greatest challenge. And the Fed is driving the market. Stock and bond correlations are at 26 year high. Uh, there's another good research piece saying that. Stock prices, 60% of stock price returns last year were, were predicted by rates. So we're, we're having correlations uh, and bonds moving the equity market, unlike any time we've seen here in modern history. And if you think about that comment of policymakers designing or engineering a capitalist system that raises productivity, which technology can do, and living standards, which technology and healthcare can do. Uh, for consumers without worse, worsening inequities, which that'll that'll likely worsen inequities and create instability, creating instability, uh, climate change, uh, there's a real chance that does that. And demographics with an aging demographics is kind of a counterbalancing force. These four forces will, uh, over the long term, create an environment um, that could potentially lead to 
again, he asked me to talk longer term, to higher levels of income inequality, uh, which could be a challenge. And that's not a, you know, that that's a that's a market stance. Income inequality seemed to have plateaued or fallen modestly. So there will need to be uh, leadership uh, underway to ensure with technological advancements, with healthcare advancements, with the demographic shift and the instability of climate change, that we're able to uh, balance these forces in a way that allows for stable economic growth. Uh, and there's some risks to that if those dynamics aren't, aren't, aren't thought through. Is that, I, I feel like I went on a tangent there that you weren't looking for, but, but you may have asked for it. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, that is in, you know, kind of what I was getting at. And in, 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 I mean, ultimately, you know, the question, I guess, is will all of those factors uh, lead to stronger productivity growth, as, as you say? And, uh, you know, and I mean, I guess. You know, McKinsey had a had a report out last year around AI and and how much of an impact it could have, and I think that you know they one they said the the gains would have probably started largely accrue maybe from twenty thirty onwards, but I think in terms of productivity growth, they had it at somewhere between you know an a, an additional growth of point one to point seven, so something fairly broad, whereas I think Goldman's then had a report. Subsequent to that, which is more upbeat, say maybe possibly one percent per annum for I don't, whatever it was, maybe ten or twenty years. So, I mean, but when you're thinking about that technology mega trend, are you largely thinking around AI, or is it robotics, or is it just, I guess, the innovative capacity of of the U.S. economy uh, in 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 many shapes or forms? It's, I'll go back to it's easy to talk about AI and how that's going to change the world, right? And harder identifying companies that are good long-term investments. I think like most things, and it's an overplayed analogy where, you know, in the 1800s gold rush, um, you didn't want to be out mining for gold. You wanted to be selling jeans and, and picks. And, and that's where the money is. You know, here uh, you have, you will have increase in productivity, and whether it's 0.1, 0.7, or 1% annualized, there will likely be increases in productivity. And so what's going to enable that behind the scenes? Yes, there are some consumer artificial intelligent uh, uh, implications of that, specifically like in like Microsoft tools uh, there, you know, with Microsoft Office, the tools that they will roll out there w will be real. But you also have engineering simulation where you can innovate faster than ever before as a result of that engineering simulation. And you can map uh, the physical world and test products easier than one could have before. So the pace of innovation uh, could just continue to grow. Now, where, what is the next new product that no one's thinking about that will result from that innovation, I don't know. But going back to, you know, selling jeans and picks, the gold mine, there are uh, companies that are at the forefront of, of this type of engineering simulation software. And also to your point, workforce uh, automation is, is going to increase productivity and he's going to be a uh, going to be a, a, a slow mega trend as well. Uh, it shouldn't scare people. I think it's going to displace as many jobs as one thing. So I think it'll create just as many uh, if we can learn if we can learn to uh, work with and not fight that technology. Okay, maybe before we leave it, just quickly on the healthcare um, point. I mean, what what are you thinking there? Is it longevity or is it? The, the fact we'll need more healthcare workers as because of the aging population or uh, or enhancements uh, in medicine, et cetera, being a, a boost for, for the economy. Anything specific around that? I'm not a healthcare expert, and that's a deeply specialized asset class, but it's, it's easy to envision a world where higher quality healthcare and greater preventative medicines lead to uh, longer lives, which have uh, meaningful implications. 
uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, in addition to that, you have you have the ability to similarly before the ability to innovate in what I talked about, kind of mapping, simulating the virtual world. There's an ability to map and simulate the body through genes um, in order to uh, have new and innovative solutions, really unlike any other time in history. And that will have uh, an enormous impact, you know, even on things like, you know, more tangibly like weight loss and Alzheimer's to uh, the other area of just living longer. And what do we do about that from, you know, a mental capacity perspective? One thing we, we touched on briefly, but curious to get your thoughts m more specifically was, you know, we touched on kind of the 2022 tough year for bonds and equities. And, you know, you talked about kind of how people were very, analysts were wrong around the, the, the recession call. A another thing we heard a lot of in 2022 was around the end of the 60-40 portfolio. And I didn't hear so much about it last year, obviously, with equities bouncing back and the 6040 doing well. I mean, from your seat, you know, running an asset management firm, is that a trend you think about that 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 asset managers, wealth managers, asset allocators will shift away from that? I mean, obviously not many people use a simple 6040, but many people use derivatives, that that kind of benchmark might shift over time. And what, what, what might a new kind of approach look like if it's not 60-40? I don't know if that concept will shift. Uh, if you look back to in the late 1970s and you just take a traditional 60-40, think S&P 500 and U.S. ag, uh, the average return is around 9.5% if you look at rolling three-year returns. I think the rolling three-year return is of most recent uh, year end was was a little south of five percent, so it it has been a challenging period. Uh, just recently, again, and those are three year returns for sixty forty portfolio. I think the bigger question is around correlation. So, if you look at the three year rolling correlation between the S and P five hundred, it's a total return including dividends, relative to the Barclays AG, right? Total return including coupons. Uh, it's at a 26-year high. So from 1998 through, it, you know, 2020, that correlation was zero to negative. It's now 0.75. And, and I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but what that means is when stocks go up, bonds go up. And when stocks go down, bonds go down. That That is a little scary to me. <laughs> and that's the point of the 60-40 portfolio, to, to provide that diversification benefit. Now, if you go back that same chart, you can think about three-year rolling correlations between the S&P 500 and the Barclays Ag. If you go back from 1978 to, say, the mid-1990s, correlations were much higher. Uh, and three-year rolling correlations were in that 0.5-ish range. So it's not uncommon for them to stay this high. What, what we've noticed is that the periods where CPI or inflation is above historical averages, the correlation between stocks and bonds remains elevated. Now, what, why is that a little scary? What does that mean? It means now a 60-40 portfolio of correlations remain what they are and you have a down market, you're not going to see the benefits that one had. So I, I, am, I do have a strong belief and I'm talking a lot about alternatives into a portfolio and you know broadly you can buck them as colds alternative investments but that namely provide uncorrelated sources of returns that are not correlated with stocks or bonds so that you can get that uh, blast in your portfolio or that kind of countermeasure in your portfolio um, to get that diversification benefit that we're not seeing and i know you've touched on the alternative sleeve within within your kind of lineup, I think, being long short equity. Um, I mean, are are there other strategies you consider within that domain in terms of quant strategies, global macro, trend following, and the futures? That whole gamut, or is that something um, that you, you, just as a firm you, you you don't have a particular offering in? 
Yeah, look, t- just as a firm, we don't have a, a particular offering there, given that we're you know leaning into uh, some of our core competencies. But, but th- there's a place for those, um, especially if they offer uh, this uncorrelated. And it's again easy to say, harder to ensure that the, 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 there's correlation benefits in the future. But that's my point. There's a real place for those now more than ever with stocks and bonds at such a high correlation. I don't know why it's not talked about more, you know, when um, the fact that bonds and big tech are correlated. It, it, it used to be, it did not used to be like that. So especially for large institutions who can, you know, capture an illiquidity or a liquidity premium uh, and capture the benefits of that illiquidity. And that doesn't necessarily have to be through alternatives, right? You have things like interval funds now um, you could have quarterly liquidity and use some leverage in order to um, better take advantage of market dislocations and you're not at the whim of uh, a, a, you know, a daily traded product. But but there's a real place in the portfolio, especially for, especially for investors with size uh, in those areas. Okay. Well, very good. I'm just conscious of time and we're getting up close to the hour. And one thing we do like to ask our guests before we wrap up, um, it's kind of advice for people starting off. And we've kind of heard a little bit. Uh, I think you're uniquely placed maybe to give it, given what you said about the 8,600 uh, interns that applied for the, for the 22 positions. All of those interns won't get the benefit of speaking to you. So maybe if they're listening in on this podcast, what advice would you have for people starting off in terms of things to do. Curious also, why would you discourage people from, from the industry in the first place? I, I think you said that. Um, but for those who are, are resolute in, in, in staying in investment management, and any kind of pointers or, or advice? Yes, I, uh, I'll, I'll go back to passion and intellectual curiosity, but then I'll give you something more tangible. And in fact, we've had a very successful program here, Rockefeller Capital Management Mentorship Pods. Uh, there's a lot of mentorship programs at companies uh, that uh, aren't as effective. Here, we have a very effective uh, mentorship pod program. And uh, maybe I could just leave two pieces of advice that I, uh, that I give to that pod. One is uh, write a 10-year life plan. Um, and what that is, is take today's day, 10 years from now, and write hour by hour what your ideal life looks like. And, and I actually got that from uh, Debbie Millman, uh, who talked about that on Tim Ferriss podcast. And that'll tell a lot about what you want to do and what drives you. And the second exercise is from Jim Collins. And those are three conjoining circles of outlining, one, what you're encoded to do, Two, what you're passionate about, and three, what's economic. And and I bring that up, people wanting to start in the industry, because ultimately, those two exercises, if you do them in an intellectually honest manner, will guide you on on what your true passion is. And and after doing those exercises, it because it, it takes passion. This is a challenging industry. It takes passion and intellectual curiosity. Those are the raw traits that you need to that that, that you need to, to to refine and after doing those exercises um you you think this industry is right for you you have to commit with you know all of your heart <laughs> and and you know you ask why do i discourage people and i probably shouldn't say this because now you know my trick i want to try to convince people not to join the industry and then you want people who understand that and just relentlessly move forward <laughs> and say, I, I hear what you're saying, but there is nothing that will convince me not to be in this industry. I want this so badly uh, that I will do whatever it takes in order to uh, be a good investor because it's hard. And there are a lot of people with just raw passion, raw intellectual curiosity who are team players. Um, and so that's what you're going to need to refine those skills and to turn that into uh, those skill sets into investment judgment and alpha is, is is a whole different thing. Very good. Great, great and interesting uh, advice. Um, well, very good, Casey. Thanks very much for joining us. It's been a, a tremendous conversation. 
Uh, so make sure to follow Casey's work because, as you can tell from today's conversation, it's an ever-changing and uncertain landscape and uh, as important as ever to be informed when allocating capital. So from all of us here at Top Traders Unplugged, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more exciting episodes, so stay tuned. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.